Hello, my name is Sarah Whitburn and I'm a women's health GP and I have an interest in vulval medicine. And I'm here today with Dr. Tanya Boll, who is a dermatologist at Jean Hales and she specialises in vulval conditions. Hello, Tanya. Hello, how are you today, Sarah? I'm good, thank you. Today we're going to be talking about vulval health and the objectives of our webinar today is to raise awareness of the clinical importance of vulval health in general practice and relevant considerations to provide guidance on how to have conversations about the vulva and vulval health and to increase your confidence to have conversations on vulval health in general practice. So I think I'll ask you, Tanya, if you wouldn't mind just going through what's normal anatomy because I think having experience of normal vulvas is, is something that both patients and practitioners don't get a lot of experience in. I think sadly that's true and that will be a pleasure. Um, so the thing to realise when you first look at a vulva is to not try and get too close initially because you can miss a lot of things on the way and this cartoon here does illustrate in the, all the anatomy that you need to keep an eye out for. You, I personally start from the outside in so what I'm looking at is the mons and what I look to find from there is, okay, is there hair? If not, how is it removed? So I'm thinking at that time, is that a possible source of irritation or allergy to the patient? So the labia majora, the labia minora should be symmetrical in that there is one on each side. They don't have to be identical. We're all, as women, different and unique and that is also reflected in our examination in the genital area. The other things to bear in mind is you should then go down the midline and what you're looking for down the midline, first of all starting at the mons pubis and going down, is your, the clitoris and the clitoral hood overlying it. Underneath that you will come to the urethral meatus, underneath that the vaginal introitus. Between that and the anus is the perineum. So if we have a look now on an actual picture of a woman, what you can see again from the outside working in, in this particular picture what you have are the labia minora and they come together at the posterior fourchette. If you then now go back to the midline you'll see the shaft of the clitoris, the glands of the clitoris, below that the urethral meatus, below that the line of fusion of the labia minora, between that and the anus is the perineum. The heart's line that you'll see marked there is actually represents where the tissue goes from being stratified squamous epithelium that's got a little bit of keratinization in it to mucous membrane and that junction will be visible in some women and not in others. It's a perfectly normal anatomical variant. As too are those little frond-like features around the hymen. In a lady who's had any obstetric manipulation you'll find hymenal remnants as opposed to the nice ring that is often illustrated in images of the vaginal opening and they're not to be confused with genital warts. Thanks, Sarah. And what we have here, Sarah, is on the left is a young woman in her reproductive years. What you can see here are the features we've mentioned. The labia majora, they are the hair bearing portion of the vulva. Next layer inside are the inner lips or the labia minora. Then if we go down the midline you see the skin over the shaft of the penis, you see the clitoral hood. Going further down we can't, we can see just a little bit of an indication on this photograph of the urethral meatus. Then you have got the vaginal introitus. Posteriorly you've got the fusion of the labia minora and there you can also appreciate the perineum and 
what you should notice when you compare that young woman in her reproductive years to the lady on the right, and both of these ladies are in fact normal anatomically, the difference is in the quality of the tissue. The tissue is much more atrophic or looks thinner, looks more fragile, doesn't look robust in the usual colour of that we're looking for. The red appears to be quite inflamed, but in actual fact it is not. This is how the tissue in this area will look if it doesn't have enough hormone there to drive the normal appearance that we would see on the left in the reproductive years. Anatomically, apart from that, the vaginal introitus is visible, but you can see there the hymen is not, and also you'll see that there is a little bit of a suggestion of a prolapse at the very back. And I think that's a really good point that you made, Tony, that those are both normal vulva. In different yes. times, different women, but normal vulva. And I find that looking at images of normal vulvas can be really, really helpful for both um, your own work, but mm. also with patients and consumers. And the slide I've got up at the moment is um, really, really helpful because it is a collection, a library, a visual library of multiple vulvas. Yes. Um, now, I know they do call it the labial library. Yes. And obviously we know the labia is part of the, the vulva. Exactly. Um, but these are lots of different images, um, both from the front and um, taking different views as well. Mm. And I find this really, really useful um, mm. clinically as well as, as for information. What, what do you think about that? I think it's an invaluable resource and we're very fortunate to have it. And I think it's a tremendous initiative uh, that incorporated the Department of Health and the women of Victoria who volunteered to have their photographs taken to be included in this. And even just at a glance up at the slide at the moment, what you will see is there are multiple different shapes and sizes. And I think that it's good for us to constantly remind ourselves that there is no such thing as the standard vulva. And the other thing is it's a good resource to get patients to have a look at, which they can do in the privacy of their own homes and sometimes with their partner. Yeah. Much better than looking at a magazine. So we've now had a look at several slides looking at what is normal vulval anatomy and the wide range that can occur in normal vulval anatomy. And I, but I think it's still hard to discuss vulval health in, in clinical situations. And I think there's lots of reasons for that. Yeah. I think one of the reasons it can be very hard to discuss vulval health is that consumers may be embarrassed to talk about such areas. Um, some people feel that this is a private area that they don't want to talk about and may not understand that um, coming and speaking to a clinician we were going to be very open and, and happy to talk about this. Consumers might also have a lack of knowledge about what is normal and, mm. and abnormal, and I think we've discussed that we have. Um, in detail. Um, but that can be a real barrier to wanting to open that conversation. And I think it is a part of the body that people can have concerns about their body and their body image. Um, the vulva is obviously um, an area that is also impacting on how people feel about themselves and their relationships. And so it often will come with other issues to starting that conversation. Mm -hmm. I think on the other side of the desk is that health practitioners might find there's barriers to starting that conversation. Um, they may have limited experience with genital or se sexual history taking through training or even their own clinical experience. Um, they may not recognise how important vulval health is. And I know when I went through general practice and, and actually went to vulval clinic, I found it um, a very uh, interesting and helpful type of training to add to my general practice. It, it is a very important part of general health as well. Um, and I think also that um, there is a bit of a lack of knowledge for health practitioners about what's out there to upskill, um, to use as patient resources or even their own management resources. Unfortunately, that is the case still, although it's certainly improving as we go. One of the big issues when we're training is that we don't get exposure to what's normal. We're often shown patients or we might get a little bit of guidance on how to take cervical screening tests, 
But the reality is when we're seeing vulvas, we're seeing them quickly because we don't want to distress the patient that we might be having an opportunity to look at. And we also are seeing it in a state of disease, usually. So appreciating what is actually normal becomes very difficult. And with that also then becomes a little bit of lack of confidence because you haven't had that exposure. Yeah. So hopefully today we'll be able to give you some tips yes. on how to open those conversations. Exactly. There are some really important clinical implications for not opening up a discussion about vulval health and I've sort of touched on how this can impact on body health, image, sexual health, relationship health and there can be quite a loss of quality of life um, either through pain or discomfort or um, through a feeling of shame or embarrassment, um, that can lead to actual mental health mm. conditions. Um, I'm sure you've seen patients and I've seen patients where a vulval condition has got them so down that they've actually felt depressed, anxious, um, lost a lot of confidence. Very true. Yep. And that is in fact something that we would hope by improving awareness that will happen less often and when it does occur that we all have our radar sensitised to pick it up and to be able to approach it to enable the patient to open mm. the discussion. To be part of the conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it can lead to sexual pain, sexual mm. problems, um, which can then impact on the whole relationship yes. as well. Um, obviously, some conditions are painful, some, mm. some skin conditions are painful, um, there are also vulval pain conditions themselves. Um, so chronic pain and discomfort, and, and as we know from other chronic pains, that can really impact on quality of life and the ability for someone to function in their day-to-day -day activities. Mm. And there's some very condition-specific issues such as lichen sclerosis, mm. um, missed skin changes, structural changes, which can lead to um, architecture changes. Um, and I'm sure you'll be able to tell me more about that um, but there's also the small risk of skin cancers as well. Yes and just at this opportunity because we you've just mentioned lichen sclerosis I think it is important that everybody be aware that whilst that is a manageable condition it does require lifetime ongoing follow-up hopefully in conjunction with the general practitioner and a specialist so that any changes that may occur that are at all suspicious, and fortunately this is actually not a common occurrence within lichen sclerosis, is dealt with earlier. But I think all those dot points, this is something that we want to be managing with a specialist and a general practitioner and, and really using it for a holistic care to avoid these kind of clinical outcomes. I think failing to look at the patient in a holistic manner is going to automatically mean that you're giving care that may be very well intentioned but isn't going to be as good as it can be. So now I'm going to move on to how to ask about vulval health. I think a really important point is to allow time for these conversations. These conversations, they need a supportive and respectful place to actually occur and to allow the consumer to be able to ask the questions that they may want to ask but feel embarrassed. I think it's also important to expect the unexpected. And what I'm saying there is that we don't want to bring our biases and our judgments into the consultation. Um, we want to allow patients to talk about the vulva, which might be embarrassing or the first time they've ever spoken about it. They also might want to talk about sexual concerns. And so it's having a really broad mind and bringing an open judgment to these kind of consultations. One of the ways that you can do that and that can be helpful is it might be good to agree terms with the patient. This is really important for all patients, but I think it's specifically important for those patients who identify as non-binary or trans patients so that you can support them with how they see and, and want to talk about their genitalia. I think that also allows you to agree with the patient how much they want to know. It is our role to be informative and knowledgeable, but I think also working with the patient at their own pace is really important. And this way you can have mindful language in an open consultation and I think that that will really help draw out 
uh, more information about Volvo Health. What do you think, Tanya? I don't think I could agree more with you, Sarah. I think it is particularly important that when you are, when you know as a doctor you're going to start a conversation along these lines, that you pay attention to what language the patient is using, because there are often clues there as to how they refer to things. Some patients will say, I don't know what you call it and describe it. And then that's an intro into, would you like me to show you a drawing or can we discuss this further and I'll tell you what the language is. Uh, and so, as you said, using the patient's terms of reference and also making no assumptions whatsoever in terms of what their sexuality is and if in fact they're sexually active, which I find myself, I've learnt a lot by letting patients tell me and you can't assume anything. No, not at all. No. Some of the ways to ask those screening questions, to, to open those kind of questions, is perhaps to normalise. So um, I might normalise in that, for that situation of that patient, their age. Um, I might say it's normal or usual to feel this way or have some of these symptoms in, in the situation they may be presenting. Here I've got some examples of post-delivery or surgery, um, if they're menopausal. Um, or if you have had a change in partner, it, it, trying to normalise and say, I've had other people say, or quite often other people say, which makes people feel that they're not the first or the only to bring up these topics. Um, to use the patient's language about their, their sex, their intimacy, um, and sometimes I might try a warning question. A warning question is where you, you broach it as the practitioner to just give the consumer patient time to realise what you're about to ask, maybe prepare themselves to answer, um, and to also normalise that that's part of your practice, which mm. I think helps as you're starting to get better at vulval health, mm. to have it as part of your just general conversation that you trot it out mm. routinely. I would like to ask a question today about your sexual health, or I'd like to ask a question today about your vulva because I always ask that when I ask about the menopause. And they're just some of the questions that I use. What about you, Tanya? What questions would you use? I think all of us as healthcare professionals tend to evolve a script that suits our personalities and the type of practice that we're in and also our different specialties and interests. I wouldn't like people to think that they have to learn a specific prescription type of discussion. I think they should do, as you suggested, use the same approach that they might to ask about a headache yeah. or about their blood pressure or about their work situation. In that same tone and with that same lack of any additional body language to imply that there's something different or special, this is part of your normal examination. This is, these are the questions you usually ask because they give you the most information and the patient will pick up on your comfort and mm. your cues. Yes, sometimes when I've talked about these questions, I say, let's all get comfortable. And I mean both the consumer and the health practitioner, mm. comfortable with the questions so that they trot out easily. Yep, exactly. And I think, as we're saying, making it part of your standard practice, part of your comfortable questions. And one of the ways you can you do this is to use opportunities that kind of present themselves to ask these questions. Um, and here on the slide, these were just some of the times I've thought about, when do I ask about vulval health? Um, a script for contraception, a script for hormonal therapy, uh, whether that be um, supporting transition or doing menopausal hormonal therapy, um, the cervical screening test. And um, when we were preparing these slides, Tanya very um, rightly pointed out that that is also a built-in time to not ask only ask questions about vulval health, but to do a vulval examination. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, very early on, Tanya mentioned that you, before looking for the for the cervix, yeah. and I, you know, I'm thinking back to when I was a medical student, and it was very important to me to do a good cervical mm. examination. You can actually stand back mm. and do a vulval examination leading on. So they go. They go hand in hand. Exactly. Um, health checks in general practice, we do have our 45 to 49 year old health checks and other mm. general health checks. 
And I think what we're trying to say is to, to get comfortable, to be part of your general health checkups, that vulval health should be part of holistic health. And of course, there are antenatal and postnatal checks that also allow for these questions. Mm. I think that's excellent. I've always felt that general practitioners are very privileged in that they see patients at these times where they, by the very nature of what the consultation is about, even if it's a very short one, if you include a little bit of vulval health or sexual health as a matter of course in what you ask, it will become second nature and you alone as that patient's practitioner have that opportunity to actually raise those issues. It's going back to that idea of a review of systems and this is as, yes. a, as important and as necessary system. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well. So the final message I'd like to give you today is to give yourself and the consumer permission to talk about these topics in an open and non-judgmental way, perhaps using screening questions, perhaps using warning questions, and to really encourage you to ask about vulval health at any moment that you feel it would be a good opportunity. And we've given you some examples of cervical screening, health checks and medication reviews. But I think making it at any time that you ask about, about health. And we hope that we have given you a few pointers in doing that in a way that makes it feel more comfortable for you. I think the most important thing is to give yourself time to listen to what your patient tells you because they will give you the cues and then from that you will develop your own language, your own approach to when and what questions you may ask and then also you can find that with time this will become more second nature to you, it will become easier and you will be able to actually enjoy the opportunity to relate to your patients regarding vulval health and in fact all their genital reproductive and relationship health because they're all intertwined and hopefully you will enjoy the opportunity and the adventure of looking after patients with vulval health issues. Thank you very much. Thank you Sarah.